hi, this is Ed Sullivan and Marco Berti, and we're here continuing our series in a podcast related to the top 10 employer mistakes and what they can do to avoid them. Today, we've got two more employer mistakes for you, and I'm Ed Sullivan. I'm Marco Berti. And the first employer mistake we want to talk about is a company's failure to investigate and conclusively confirm the factual basis for the termination, which might sound counterintuitive to some employers, but it'd be very important and helpful, frankly, if they would. Mark, why don't you expound a little bit? Sure. Even though we've got at-will employment, it's not a good idea to just fire somebody on a hunch or based on an allegation you haven't nailed down. And a good example of a case where it backfired uh, on employers is case on your slide here, uh, which is available on our website, slide number five, uh, Smith versus Xerox. And there you had an employee who'd worked for Xerox 20 some years in sales, had a manager she wasn't getting along with, and she filed an EEOC charge. Uh, and after she filed the EEOC charge, her boss wrote her up and said that she had turned in some expense reimbursement requests. They were, they were small amounts of money, I think around $100. Uh, for uh, travel-related expenses on a day in which, according to his record, she was actually off, wasn't even working that day. So he just jumped to the conclusion that this must be some sort of fraudulent activity on her behalf. She's trying to get money she doesn't, she's not entitled to, and wrote her up. Well, eventually she was fired and she sued for retaliation, claiming that she was really fired in retaliation for her EEOC charge. And one of her pieces of evidence was that, according to her, in fact, uh, she had visited clients on her day off and she had gotten her car washed and incurred some mileage and in her mind since she had visited those clients uh, what that was a reasonable thing to do is to request those reimbursements and even the HR manager backed her up on that and so here you are now in front of the jury and it makes the manager look like he was really not interested in the truth but out to get the person and she prevailed in the case and won and the Fifth Circuit affirmed it. So that's a good example of the better practices. If you have a question or a concern, you go to the person, you have them write out their side of the story, you nail it down 100% before you do anything. I kind of want to bring this at a fundamental level if you're a, a small business or medium-sized business and you're watching this. One, do you have a legal obligation to do these investigations and write out factual basis for terminations? No. Does that still mean, separate and apart from that, that it's not a good idea to do so? And the answer is, of course it's a good idea to do so. You should do it. Yes, it's extra paperwork. But yes, you're under no obligation to do it. The question is, what puts you in the best legal defense possible? You know, and what can we do when we document our investigations, when we show wrongdoing, and we show reasons for termination? It can do nothing but help employers in litigation. Yes, you don't have to actually even have a reason so long as it's not an illegal reason. Yes, you don't have to do any of this, but wouldn't it be better if you did? Yeah, and uh, believe me, if you just go on the phrase, words in the air aren't there, uh, you better believe the plaintiff is going to have a good story after they get a lawyer. We've seen this many times where the plaintiff gets fired and the company didn't really document and nail down the investigation. Uh, the employee then gets a lawyer and comes up with a pretty good story after the fact to try to create a case. So it's really protection for yourself to nail this all down in writing in advance. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next employer mistake. And, and this one really, no matter if you're a Fortune, five, uh, Fortune 100 company or, or even the, you know any company more than 15 employees, you can easily fall into the many traps under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So right now we kind of want to hit with a few. I should say that the law was recently amended and what the law really did in the old days, defense, defense lawyers and defendants in general would argue that basically a, a very specific uh, initial element to a plaintiff's case wasn't there. That element be whether or not the plaintiff was in fact disabled or not. Disabled is a term of art, or it used to be at least under the law and defendants were very good at pointing out for a variety of reasons, and they were helped with United States Supreme Court decisions, uh, pointing out that individual folks were not actually disabled or regarded as disabled. That's all changed now. Now, the law basically has, a, it's not a presumption, but they've so broadened the definition of disability, and it's a clear indication by Congress that they don't want, uh, unless in the most simple of cases, anyone to fight over whether or not someone's disabled, Instead, they want to get onto other issues, and there's many ways that employers can violate the ADA completely unknowingly and completely in good faith. We're lucky to have Marco Berti, literally probably one of 
the state of Texas' best experts on the ADA, and I can't think of a case he didn't read. So, Mark, why don't you tee it off on, on some mistakes that employers make in violating the ADA? Well, thanks for the great introduction on that, Ed. Uh, yeah, for example, you hear, of course, that, oh, gee, employers have a duty to make a reasonable accommodation for a disabled employee who has some workplace limitation. Well, what is that? How does that really play out? Well, what the EEOC says and what the courts have said is once the employee has put the employer on notice, and it doesn't have to be formal, uh, that they've got a disability that's causing a workplace limitation and they want some sort of accommodation, well, then they've initiated what's called the interactive process. And the employer has an obligation to engage an interactive process, a discussion, a communication that's interactive to discuss with the employee if and how that limitation uh, at work can be accommodated reasonably so that the essential functions of the job can get done, but yet at the same time, the employee's workplace limitation that's caused by their disability uh, will not prevent them from having a job at the company. And so uh, the first tip is, and this comes out of a case called Gagliardo, is you need to be sure you can recognize and you understand when your duty to engage in this interactive process has been triggered. In that case, you had an employee who had multiple sclerosis who uh, was having some problems with her job. It was a specific part of her job and, and a coworker had said, well, I'll do that for you. In return, you do an equal percentage of my job that you can do. Everybody said, great, but HR didn't buy off on it and even though uh, the employee brought this to HR's attention, told them about her multiple sclerosis and the limitation and what the accommodation was that she wanted. Instead, HR wrote her up for not being able to do that one particular aspect of her job that her MS uh, caused problems, eventually fired her. She went to trial and she recovered a multi-million dollar verdict. Went up on appeal and the court of appeal said, sure, you win employee, because you know what? The employer was told hey, I've got MS, which is a disability, or at least it's put them on notice of a possible disability. I've got this workplace limitation, and here's my proposal for reasonable accommodation. And they just, the ball, just like in a tennis game, ball just got hit into their court and zipped right by them. They never even noticed that the ball was in their court, so they never hit it back. They lost the case because they didn't recognize that the employee had initiated the interactive process, instead just proceeded with discipline and termination. So that's the first thing. You really need to be careful to understand and train your folks. Hey, the employee's initiated the interactive process. Time to start talking. Mark, let me ask you a question on that because a lot of times I'll get a call from a company and the employee hasn't come forward with an interactive uh, process question. But the employer has a suspicion, either reasonable or not, that there's something going on with that employee. They don't know if they're disabled as a matter of the law, but they do know that that employee is either acting strange or is limping or has some issue with respect to their health. Does the employer have an obligation to inquire further on the interactive process? Well, the general answer is if the employee hasn't asked for an accommodation, uh, then the employer has no obligation to go unilaterally initiate the conversation. But, of course, as with any general rule, there are some exceptions. And what the courts say is if the disability, the resulting limitation, and the uh, apparent accommodation necessary to overcome that limitation are all open, obvious, and apparent, well then the employer would have a unilateral obligation to start the interactive process discussion. An example for uh, might be an employee in a wheelchair, uh, permanently in a wheelchair, who can't reach a file above their head, well, okay, if you see that going on as an employer, that's open office and apparent you have a duty to start it, start uh, the process. Other than the open office and apparent it's situation, though, you don't have such obligation. And frankly, there are some downsides to doing it. So Mark, that's how it comes up. Well, Mark, what about the next part of the question, which is no matter how it starts, whether the employee brings it up or the employer brings it up, a discussion is held about what's going on with that employee and whether or not they need a reasonable accommodation. You know, what happens if the employee says, well, I need, you know, X solution to my problem, uh, but the company can't really accommodate it by making X, but they can think, oh, well, you know, uh, we could do Y or Z, but the employee only asked for X, so we're not going to talk about these alternative solutions. Does the company uh, have an obligation to make other alternative suggestions uh, in the interactive process? Yes, uh, and that's the best practices. If the employee says, oh, well, you know, I've got this limitation caused by a disability and I want a permanent helper for the rest of my career with the company dedicated to me, well, that wouldn't be reasonable as a matter of law, likely. Uh, but that doesn't mean the employee can employer can just sweep that aside and say, no, you don't get that, you're fired. 
uh, consistent with the phrase interactive process, uh, the employer may have an obligation to discuss things further. And we always recommend that if the employer's I employee's idea isn't reasonable, you tell them why it's not reasonable in writing and verbally. And then you, you propose some uh, alternatives or at a minimum, give them another opportunity to propose some other alternatives. Now, sometimes uh, you do exhaust all the alternatives and nothing comes up and the employee cannot be retained any further. And even then, you want to document that the right way. Mark, what is the, you know, from an employer perspective, sometimes an employee will come with uh, some disability claim or an issue that they say has, that they have at the workplace and they want an accommodation, but yet remarkably at the same time, the company is having problems with that particular employee that might require disciplinary action, write-ups, termination, or whatever. Where does that intersect? How much can an employee, frankly, get away with before a company is allowed to take appropriate action based on legitimate workplace concerns against an employee? Well, I mean, uh, then that does come up. Now, on the one hand, the law is pretty clear that if the employee is engaging in you know, some outrageous behavior like violence or threatened violence, you can discipline them. And even if on the, you know, the precipice of discipline, they say, oh, it's because of my bipolar schizophrenia that I lashed out and acted violently or cussed out my supervisor. The law is clear. Hey, there's some work rules like that. You can discipline them irrespective if their uh, problem or what their interaction was caused by a disability. On the other hand, there's some other examples. And regrettably, even though these laws are passed with the best of intentions, there are on occasion some employees that misuse them. And for example, you might have somebody you're going to let go for attendance problems. And just as you're about ready to let them go, they tell you, oh, this is really caused by my uh, you know, sleep apnea that I didn't tell you about. But I have to tell you about now because you're going to fire me. And in that circumstance, sure, you could plow forward and fire them anyway. And if they're uh, lying about it and making it up and trying to use it as a, a, a shield to protect themselves from the legitimate consequences of their own misconduct, well, then you'd be fine. But probably safer bet to go ahead and document they never told you about it before, document that they uh, kind of curiously told you about it on the eve of termination, and then move forward with a proper interactive process from that point. Uh, Mark, on another point that you see a lot of companies, they don't have light duty jobs. They may be manufacturing or they may be some issue where there is no light duty job. Yet, on the other hand, the ADA mandates that uh, persons who are actually or regarded as disabled are entitled to reasonable accommodation on the workforce. What's the intersection there? Well, uh, the, the main intersection you see in the case law is some employers that are, back in the old days, they would tell people, you can't come to work unless you got a full duty release or you're fully healed. And the intersection there is the ADA says, no, wait a second. If a person's disabled, they're considered a qualified individual with a disability so long as they can perform the essential functions of the job. Not all the functions, just the essential functions. So some courts, uh, there's been some cases where the employee wasn't allowed to come back to work because they didn't have a full duty release, but they could prove the only reason they didn't get the full duty release was they couldn't do the marginal functions of the job, but could do the essential functions Hence, they were barred from the workplace illegally and they were able to prevail under the ADA, including this Barber case from the Fifth Circuit, which is essentially that fact pattern, and the Fifth Circuit ruled for the plaintiff. Mark, what about a case where you have an employee who has, let's say, uh, has had disciplinary problems in the past, and those disciplinary problems were in fact a result of or contributed to because of the actual disability. The employer may not have known that at the time, but they, they came to learn that later on. Um, yet the employer sort of wants to plow forward with termination. A uh, good idea or bad idea? Well, I mean, you have to follow the reasonable accommodation path and take it where it, uh, take it, where it takes you and, and not deviate from that uh, for any extraneous reason. For example, in this Riel case, which is on your slide from the Fifth Circuit, uh, you had an engineer who had diabetes and he was unable to perform uh, some of the projects in as a timely a fashion as they liked him to or at least perform certain milestone uh, measurements of those projects as quickly as they liked uh, because of the ebb and flow of his uh, diabetic condition on himself. He asked for a transfer to a position that didn't require these sorts of deadlines. And they said, okay, normally that would be reasonable, but because you've been disciplined for not meeting these deadlines in the last six months, we can't transfer you. And uh, the court said, that's not fair because uh, it would be normally reasonable to transfer. You, you can't not transfer simply because uh, of the, the workplace limitations that were caused by the disability. So you have to be careful of that trap.